Please join me with a big welcome for our dear friend, Dr. Susanna Samos. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to the second day of our conference. For the ones who were here yesterday, welcome back. For the ones who are coming for the first time, we're glad that you're able to make it here on our second day. Today, we are going to talk about our topic is the role of the Spiritual Center as a healing place. If you were here yesterday, you heard me talking about the goal of this conference, and I said in my opening remarks that one of the goals is to bring enlightenment and to assist the spiritual movement in Florida. So in preparation for this lecture, I would like to share with you that I heard at least 10 times in my car driving back and forward from work the lecture done by my friend Alberto Almeida in, he's catching up with the translation, in the third conference that we had here where he spoke about uh, healing. And I will have many references from his lectures, so thank you for that. And if you're not following, I'll tell you later because he's looking at me like I'm not talking to him. <laughs> All right. And in taking from his lecture, and also if we refer to the things that we heard about yesterday, I started to question, I actually chose the titles of the talks that you um, heard yesterday and will hear today, and I chose this topic, the role of the spiritual center as a healing place. And based on his suggestion, and also based on what we heard yesterday, I took the liberty, and I think if you were here yesterday, you will understand, and um, hopefully you will understand by the end of the lecture today, why we change it from the role of the Spiritual Center as a healing place to the role of the Spiritual Center in promoting spiritual health. It seems to make more sense, truly, because as we heard yesterday, healing in the spiritual view means healing not of the periphery, but healing of the spirit. And if it is healing of the spirit, that means that the person who is ill needs to be an active participant in the healing process and needs to be ready to be healed. Therefore, I am not able to heal anyone, nor is the spiritual center in a role of healing anyone, and not even Jesus was able to truly heal the ones who were not ready to be healed. So we are going to talk today about the role of the spiritual center in promoting spiritual health. And I usually like to open the talks by bringing some sort of inspirational quote and so I found this one by Confucius where, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do better with these two things at the same time. But when Confucius said, at 15, my heart was set on learning. At 30, I stood firm. At 40, I had no more doubts. At 50, I knew the mandate of heaven. At 60, my ear was obedient. At 70, I could follow my heart's desire without transgressing the law. And this is a beautiful quote that speaks about the journey of healing. And it does so because, as we heard about yesterday, and we'll revisit some of the concepts today for the ones who were not here yesterday. Healing is a journey that has everything to do, and in essence, is speaks about our connection with the Creator. So if you look at this quote, it is about someone who is willing to take the journey of learning, of understanding, of getting educated about the meaning and the purpose of life, to the point where you are sure about the journey, to the point where you no longer doubt life, 
to the point that you understand the laws of God, to the point that even though your temporary desire might, be, might seem contrary to God's desire for you, you are able now to be obedient. And then finally, you're able to follow your heart's desire without transgressing the law because your heart's desire is God's desire. And that truly is. Our desire, our will, what we will and wish for ourselves is not different than what God, God's will is for us. So when we come to this place of the journey, we will then come to the concept of health and, he- and uh, illness. We heard this concept shared with us here yesterday by different people, with different ways, with different words, and we chose the concept that we find in the book Healing and Self-Healing by our friend Dr. Andre Moreira. And in this book, he says that real health is the connection of the creature with the creator, and illness is the momentary state contrary to this fact. So real health is that moment, again, where my desire, my most inner desire, in no way, no way will transgress the law because it is one with God's desire for myself. Under this concept, we are talking about the health of the spirit. And he goes forward to speak about the concept of illness. And in speaking about illness, he will define it as an invitation from the body from the inner wisdom existing within each person to realign itself with your own consciousness or God's laws, as well as with your neighbor and the universe. So in here, he speaks about illness as an invitation. From this innate wisdom existing within each one of us, which is God within us, we carry God within us in our consciousness. So when we speak about God's mercifulness and God's love for each one of us, and the fact that God takes care of each one of us personally, God does so because the laws of the universe are both outside and within ourselves, always inviting, and I like this word, always conspiring for our benefit and for our health. So this God within operates in us, inviting us every time that we distance ourselves from the harmony of the universe to realign ourselves and the diseases will manifest themselves in the physical body. So with spiritism we learn that there is a purpose. Everything happens for a purpose. And always, again, with the intent of helping us of rehabilitating us, of taking us back to the path of happiness and peace. That does not mean to say, because we've been focusing so much in the spirit, that we should neglect the temple. The temple is important. And was again um, in um, Alberto Almeida's talk that he mentioned that the temple is important and necessary for the sacred being that inhabits it to act, but the temple is not more than its owner. So we're going to stop here to uh, think about this uh, statement for a little bit. So the temple is important, but what we need to realize is this temple is secondary to the spirit, to the immortal spirit. And even though I believe we are in a room with spiritists and or spiritualists, meaning people who do believe and do know that we are immortal beings, we can agree that in our daily lives, this knowledge does not manifest itself necessarily in our thoughts and in our actions. So I'll give you a few examples that speaks to the fact that Even though we know to be mortal beings, it's not necessarily expressed in the ways in which we think and we live. 
So if someone passes away, we might hear someone saying, Miss Smith will be buried today. Well, hopefully not. Miss Smith is somewhere else. And what's being buried is her physical body. But when we speak, we speak with the way as if the person itself is being buried, which is not true. Now, we also, and this was mentioned yesterday, continue to refer to our spirit as my spirit. People, we are in the I era. The era of the iPhones, <laughs> the era of the iPads, the era of the i i selfies everywhere. <laughs> Why not the era, I'm sorry, of the i spirit? I spirit. So it's come a time when we need to shift from my spirit, and hopefully once we leave here today, we'll all be saying I spirit. Because it truly reflects what we believe and what we know, that we are immortal beings. But we continue to try to remain immortal in our, in our physicality. So we try to make this physical body, this material body, immortal. And so we will spend so much of our energy and sometimes of our money and sometimes of money that we don't have to remain young and immortal, materially speaking. So those are just few examples brief examples that speak about our difficulty because the knowledge remains cognitive and intellectual. Now, who is in the spiritual centers, running the spiritual centers? We are. And so, sometimes the spiritual center too will focus more on the disease, the material, the person who comes in, the physical body that comes in, then to the immortal spirit. And a lot of times we see, still in the movement here and abroad, that the healing, the healing work becomes the primary work of that spiritual center. Attracting people who are seeking healing but what type of healing are we talking about? And what is the true role of the spiritual center? If we are stopping on the physicality, we are stopping on what needs to be secondary. So many lectures that talk about health and illness will focus on the work of passes, the uh, blessed water, the intervention of the spirits, in our period spirits right now, they're working on us, believe me. But that is secondary. That is what we call mercifulness of God. So we have these resources that help us on today today to boost our energy and to help us to continue to do the true work of healing, which is the work of the soul. But when people come to the spiritual center and they arrive asking, do you have some sort of healing work here at your spiritual center? We have to be mindful that not everybody who arrives seeking for healing is truly seeking for healing. So Andre Moreira in his book, he has an interesting uh, statement. He will say, the big majority of sick persons desire numbness and not consciousness. It is very fair that symptoms are relieved, avoiding unnecessary and unproductive suffering. But the educational process that frees the individual from ignorance and dependence is fundamental in the reconstructive process of health or in the prophylaxis of diseases of the body and of the soul. So, if there would be out there a pill, a powerful pill, 
that could heal everything and anything, who would want it? Me, sometimes. Right? Right? Because we, we are so used to looking for those things that can fix everything right away, like chocolate. <laughs> if you follow me on Facebook, you saw that recently I heard that there is a shortage of cocoa in the world, and I'm freaking out. <laughs> because when I'm exhausted, I eat chocolate. And if I'm super happy, I also eat chocolate. <laughs> and if I'm a little sad, believe me, I'll eat a piece of chocolate, and it feels immediately better. <laughs> and we do that. We would like to get things that can quickly fix our problems. <coughs> and so Alberto Almeida, in his lecture, he mentioned how people, and I love that, and I have used over a few lectures, you go to the Spiritist Center, and you sit, to listen to the lecture, and you sleep. <laughs> and then, when you enter the passes room, you wake up and you turn your hands to receive. <laughs> because we are continue to seek these external resources that can help healing and solve our problems. But what we need to be looking for is Education, as he says here, because it is the education. It is those gospel pills that are being given to you during the lecture that will ultimately allow for true healing. So the Spiritual Center, following this line of thought, should not be a new edition of traditional temples and religions. The spiritist moves in the opposite direction. It does not hold any external rituals that distance the creature from the most pure and crystalline reality. So it is fair that we offer assistance, immediate assistance, and this is precisely what Jesus did and taught us and expect us to do, to reach out and help others. But the spiritual center cannot be that place where we go looking for Susanna, Marcelo, for them to solve our problems. We were in a study group recently and, uh, in English, and this lady, who is the mother of uh, one of the participants, she just joined us. She's 90-something years old, and she made a very special comment to me another day. She said, I come here to this group, and you guys talk, 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 and give no solutions for any problems. <laughs> and I said to her, that's awesome, because that's exactly the way it's supposed to be. We are not here to solve your problems. We are here to empower you, to give you the tools so you can figure out your life. And so that's the role of the Spiritual Center. Now, let's then talk about, once we enter the Spiritual Center, what should we find? We should find the Consoler. As it was promised to us, and we find in the Gospel of John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So when we come to the spiritual center, when we arrive at the spiritual center, people need to find consolation. And consolation comes from the understanding of our immortality and the purpose of our lives and our existence. It comes as we also um, see in this very good book by Alirio Cerqueira Filho, The Spiritual Center and the Promotion of the Immortal Being. He speaks about the goal of spiritism in being to revive the message of Christ in spirit and in truth, to bring Christianity to humanity under the compass of the basics work of Alain Kardec. So, we should find the message of Jesus revived. 
The teachings of Alan Kardec will unveil many of the things that we could not understand. And now we have a broader understanding of the meaning of life and of the things that we should be doing in the path towards enlightenment. And besides the promotion of the spiritist message, we should be promoting the immortal spirit by inviting the creature to think and to feel as an immortal being. We all believe, does anyone do not believe that you are a spirit? Probably not, everybody knows that. But what the spiritual sense is going to promote is a space where through the study, through, through reflection and through service, we will more and more feel as immortal beings. And the role of the spiritual center will be then to empower each one of us as immortal beings to take charge of our own health and our own des destiny. So I like this uh, picture because um, it kind of illustrates um, what I think that the spiritual center is this space, it's like a bridge where we will be offering going back to the idea of education, intellectual knowledge, moral knowledge, and existential knowledge. Intellectual, moral, and existential. Or we could say we are going to learn at a cognitive level, at an emotional feeling level, and also reach the understanding of life. So, we go to the spiritual center and the educational process it starts by going to our groups, studying and learning. But the groups should not stop in intellectual and cognitive learning. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. It should help us bridge us to our inner world and help us to understand where we stand in our evolution. What feelings do we have? How does the information that we receive apply to our lives? How does the information that we receive chooses the meaning of our life? So it needs to be a space of reflection because it is through the reflection and the study that the empowerment will become. And most importantly, I think that it should bridge us towards our moral cosmos. In Genesis, there is a chapter that talks about the end of the world and the new era that is arriving. And we all know that we, our brains are doing well in the sense that we have achieved tremendous amount of intellectual knowledge and understanding and scientific advance. However, morally speaking, understanding this inner universe called feelings and emotions and I say this over and over, it wasn't until probably the age of 30, 30 years old that I actually learned to name my feelings because I marry a psychologist. <laughs> so it, there is an advantage on that. There's some disadvantages, I should say, <laughs> but some advantages because I was introduced to the world of feelings. And it was a very powerful in, to, in terms of empowering me and give me the power to understand what I was feeling. Give names to feelings. If you had heard me speaking, I'm always bringing stories that I tell my kids and all of them, teach them, this is anger, this is happiness, this is resentment, and these are okay. They are telling you something, they are giving you a message about you. Let's try to understand them. And so I am delighted that they, at the age of five and six, are learning what I only went to learn when I was 35, I believe. But this is very important. This is a very important part of the process of, edu of education. And Kardec, in asking the spirits in the spirits book um, about education in this question, the spirits are gonna speak to him about education and mention the fact that's not intellectual education, but more education that we should be focusing on. And it's not more education through the books, but that which consists in the art of forming character, that which creates habits, because education is the sum of acquired habits. And we had a discussion, Arudu, I believe, was talking about 
um, the changing habits. And there were some questions to Daniel. Um, I don't know who was with you yesterday. But, yes, and, and uh, about, you know, how do you change your habits? How do you get to that point of, like, transformation? Because it's difficult. It's very difficult. And I will tell you that if nothing else works, there will come a point in your life where you'll be so miserable from the old patterns and old behaviors that you yourself cannot take it anymore. And that point is exactly the point that Jesus talks about in the parable of the prodigal son, is when we are feeding the pigs in our lives. We have reached the bottom. So you don't need to reach the bottom. But a lot of time when nothing else works, it is that bottom that will give you the energy and the insight that something needs to change in your life. And so, education. Education, meaning, investment. If you don't want to reach the bottom, we need to be actively investing on our education. We need to be actively investing on the development of our virtues. We need to be actively investing on bringing all this intellectual knowledge into our hearts, the education of the soul. And Dr. Bezerra de Menezes, in speaking about uh, the spiritual center, he called it nucleus of renewal. The spiritual nuclei must leave the level of temple of beliefs to become an enablement school of virtues and affirmation of good men and women. Love that statement, enablement school. We have to promote our homes, our groups, from emergency stations, providing relief and help to nucleus of social and human renewal. We will accomplish this by stimulating the development of ethical and noble values able to generate renewal. To reach this goal, there's only one way, education. So those are really nice ideas to bring to our spiritual center. And if you are work of a spiritual center, or if you are um, a director, the president, the vice president, or if you're going to a spiritual center, is this what you're finding? Is your spiritual center an enablement school? Or is it a place where people come, they are attended in their immediate needs and sufferings and pains, and then what's the next step for that person? It needs to be a system in place to promote the individual, to give the individual back the power that he or she lost somewhere along the way. And if it is a school of education, who is the teacher? Jesus. And so we are going to reach out to the, G to the teacher right now, again, using and borrowing from our friend, Dr. Andre Moreira, in his book, Healing and Self-Healing, a Spiritist Medical View, unfortunately not yet in English, but it's a pearl, it's precious, this book. And in here, he will refer to five healings done by Jesus. So we're gonna touch very briefly on them and uh, if, I really encourage if you um, can to uh, have the book and, and read the chapters because it's, um, it's very beautiful. But the first healing is the healing of Bartimaeus. And it's in, in the Gospel of Mark. So Bartimaeus was a beggar on the side of the road. And Jesus is passing by, as always, with the crowd around him. And Bartimaeus calls for Jesus. And Jesus stops and tells Bartimaeus to stand up and to come to meet him. Now, Bartimaeus represents many of us who go through life in the condition of people who have not to offer, but who need the arms of others in order to survive. So Bartimaeus represents us in our powerlessness. 
And what's interesting in this passage is that as he stands, he removes his cloak, which means that he removed all the things that he used to protect himself from his fears, perhaps from shame, all the illusions. He needs to put that aside and stand up and walk towards Jesus. And Jesus, of course, knew exactly what he needed, but he was Bartimaeus, what do you need or want from me? And Bartimaeus will say, will say, I would like to see. So in the path for healing, the first thing that we need to do is to be able to see. Not with the physical eyes, because what was restituted in that moment was way more than the ability to see with the eyes. What's restituted to him in that moment was the ability to have a spiritual sight, to understand, to see the true purpose of life. Then Jesus goes on, and we find in the Gospel of John the healing that happens at the pool of Bethesda. And in this pool, we have the paralyzed man who has been there for many years waiting for the opportunity to jump into those waters who uh, were said that heal people. But he was paralyzed. He could not move. So Jesus comes and heals the man. Because in the journey for healing, it's not necessary only that we see, but it's important that we walk. It's important that we are able actually to move to overcome the spiritual inertia where we remain for a long time. And in another healing, Jesus will heal the 10 men with leprosy. Leprosy is a disease of the skin and of the nervous system. It's a disease that at the time promoted segregation, separation. So Jesus will heal the 10 men and will tell them that they need to go back to the city and present themselves to the priests so that they could be reinserted into society. This is a very powerful passage because, as we know, out of the 10, only one returns to thank Jesus, meaning that even though all of the 10, the ten men were healed peripherally, only one of them achieved through healing. And so this healing means that in order to heal, we also need after we see and after we walk, we need to be willing to relate to one another with sensitivity, trying to be useful in the society where we find ourselves. In Matthew, we find Jesus healing the man who was possessed. And each of the healings will have very special and unique features to it. In this one, Jesus will do something different. He will ask the man, he will ask the spirit, what is his name? And the spirit will say, my name is Legion, because we are so many. And so when Jesus asks someone's name, what he's trying to do is to reestablish in that person the sense of true self, who you truly are as a divine being, as a child of God. So we need to see, we need to walk, we need to relate with sensitivity, and we need to realize and understand that we are unique, special, divine beings, children, child of God. And then finally, in Luke, we'll find Jesus healing on a Saturday, the man with the shriveled hand. Now, you're not supposed to heal on the Saturdays, but with this healing, Jesus is going to teach us the importance of service, the importance of attaining one's needs above the rules and the conventions. Many times, unfortunately, we still see in the spiritual centers the rules being placed above people's needs. And so the rules are absolutely necessary, but they cannot be so rigid that people are not attended in their need and in their suffering. 
So Jesus here breaks the rules to show the importance of servicing at all times and at any time. All right, so to see, to walk, to interact, to be, to serve, to heal. The journey that we are proposing today and that the spiritual center should promote for the person who arrives. Household. So let's look at the role of the spiritual center in the supporting, in supporting spiritual health. So I made a little um, parallel between the healings of Jesus and the role of the spiritual center. And this comes from my mind. So um, let's, sorry about that. Here we are. So we are going to do a parallel between these healings and the role of the spiritual center. Because when we enter the spiritual center, we should find Jesus there. And what I mean by that is this. Every single department, every single activity should in some way express the way in which Jesus lived and taught. And so Jesus should be present. The activities of the spiritual centers are built based on the ways that he lived and the ways that he taught. So where do we think that we will achieve and reach spiritual sight in the spiritual center? If we can muscle our fatigue and stay awake during the lectures, right? So we will gain sight in the public meetings. And then sometimes I hear the public saying, but this lecture was so basic. I heard this so many times already. Like lectures on forgiveness, for instance. You know, every spirit center has at least a few of them a year. Right? And so, yeah, good. Are you able to forgive now? If not, then keep listening. You know? Try to stay awake. Because you really, really need that. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgave someone who, you know spoke bad about me. But if it's a hard offense, right, for betrayal, are we able to forgive? So we need to be there listening to all those lectures and trying not to sleep. So in the, in the uh, spiritual center, the public meetings and the study groups will be the opportunities to give us the spiritual sight that we need in order to heal. Now, the uh, movement, the ability to walk comes from the reflection. And I borrowed this term from a little Sikarafilio. He speaks about, he proposes that the spiritual center have what he calls applied reflexive studies. Where again, any and every single study, no matter if you're studying Genesis, heaven and hell, spirit's book or gospel, you should be facilitating the group in terms of thinking all right, I'm learning about fluids in Genesis. How does that impact my life? What does that mean? How is that going to change my existence? So we need to be moving. How, what does that mean in terms of my spiritual health? So you now understand about the role of thoughts. We thought about that yesterday. We thought about the period spirit. So we understood about fluids. I don't do just talk about it. So if I am in a position of anger, of resentment, how is that affecting my spiritual health? And so you start to, to understand why you should move, why you should change, why you should seek transformation, and then the movement within the soul starts to take place. There are two little stories that I'll share with you. One about spiritual sight is found on the book, The Alchemist, by Paulo Coelho. And in this book, it's a little story I'd like to throw out there so you guys don't get too tired of all the philosophy. So in this uh, book, uh, Paulo Coelho tells that a man is seeking for enlightenment, and he goes to see this master who lives in this outstanding um, castle. And goes to the master and says to the master, Master, I would like to reach enlightenment. Master says to him, very simple, take this spoon, two drops of oil, walk around my castle and my properties, come back here, make sure the two drops 
remain in the spoon. So the man goes, walks around, take hours because it's a huge place, comes back, master, here I am. He was happy. The two drops were right there. And so the master says to him, tell me about the things that you saw. Well, master, I didn't see anything. I was looking at my two drops in the spoon. Well, how can you be seeking enlightenment and miss all the beauties of the house of the master? Go back and pay attention to them. So the man goes, comes back, really surprised. Master, what a magnificent castle you have and your properties and the gardens and the pictures, the rugs, the furniture. And the master said, but where are the two drops of oil? But master, it's impossible. He said, well, but that's really what you need in order to reach enlightenment. You need to be able to see the universe outside of you, and you need to see the things that are close to you, close to your heart. So we need to see. But more than see, we need to be able to walk. And so there's another little story, so that we can be above the difficulties of life, so to speak. So that's a, a little bit more well-known story, the story of a master who was also a boatman, and so his job was to cross people from one side of the river to the other side of the river, which is really what masters should be doing, helping people to cross from the edge of ignorance and unconsciousness to the edge of knowledge. And so this man who was a very um, intellectual professor needs the service of the masters and, and asks him, can you please help me cross to the other edge of the river? Sure. So the two men get into the boat, and they're crossing. And because it was a long um, journey, they start a conversation. And the professor asks the masters, in this life, did you have a chance to study the sciences, biology, physics? And the boatman says, no, I didn't. And the professor says to him, I'm so sorry. You just lost half of your life. And so the journey continues on, and then the boat re hits a rock and starts to go down. And the boatman says to the professor, Professor, do you know how to swim? <laughs> and the professor says, No, I don't. I'm so sorry, you just lost your entire life. <laughs> and so, in the spiritual center, more than the ability to see, we need to pe teach people to swim. We need to teach people to walk. We need to teach people to stay above the water so they can breathe. Because there is light, times in life that the flow of the river is strong. But we can, with the right tools, with the tools of the gospel, we can survive and have the strength to overcome any situation in our lives. And so there is uh, reintegration. Reintegration will take place through fraternal welcome and acceptance. Every single person in this room and in this world wants the same thing, wants to be loved, wants to be accepted, wants to feel that he or she belongs to something. So when someone arrives at the spiritual center, we welcome that person with open arms. Not the physical body who came in, but the spirit who just entered our center. And in that welcoming, so much healing takes place. We think about healing sometimes in different ways. We're so narrow in thinking of passes, water, this obsession, please, right? It's the highlight. But... Fraternal welcoming. People who arrive to the Conscious Living Spirits group, they say to me, or they call me, do you guys hold healing services? We don't have any special type. Some centers have. There's a place for everything. We don't. And I always say, and I tell uh, my uh, friends there, please say yes. Of course. And if the person just walked through the door, I said, yes, and guess what? Your healing already started. You left your home, came all the way over here. <laughs> You're already moving. Now you're entering this temple, these vibrations. We already love you, welcome. 
So healings take place. And Alberto made to share a story that I'm going to share with you. Um, and there is no way in this life or the next that I can tell the story the way he did. So if you want to go back and uh, listen to it on YouTube, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> and it's a story about uh, Chico Xavier, who um, one time received a man who was a psychologist and who had um, surfers... Um, sexual abuse, he was being sexually abused um, one time, and he goes and looks for Chico, and he tells him about his story, and Chico tells him, my son, don't worry, you're gonna be fine, everything's gonna be okay, and uh, embrace him and welcome him, and he left, he didn't really know exactly what Chico meant by everything's going to be okay. It happens that he went back relating to the person who had been the abuser, and the abuse happened another time. And then later on in his life, he found out he had AIDS. So he goes back to Chico, and he tells Chico, Chico, I have something horrible to tell you. I have AIDS. Oh, my son. But I, too, I have so many different things I can barely see. I have all kinds of pains. You have no idea. But Chico, you don't understand. There's no healing for this. But my son, there are so many people out there living with diseases that will never heal. Greed. Jealousy. Envy. But Chico, you don't understand. I'm going to die. Me too, my son. <laughs> Me too. I too will die. And in that very brief conversation where the welcoming, the non-judgment, the acceptance, but also the firm instructions that come from the knowledge of the immortality of the soul help that man not to go into the road of suicide that he was already contemplating. Today, he remains a worker in the spiritist movement, healed by that conversation, and she was no longer with us. So, healing taking place, as we said yesterday, you can still have a disease, and yet have a healthy, be in a state of uh, spiritual health. Individualization, um, I put here when um, referring to the healing, when he asked uh, the, the person's name, the work of mediumship, and I put the word self-disobsession. I don't even know if it exists, but I created it. And so, um, self-disobsession, because I think that that is one important work that we should be doing in the spiritual center. The disobsession is okay, yes, it is okay, but more, more powerful than telling the spirit, please go away, is telling you, please raise your level of vibration, right? And in doing that, find out your true will. And find out that your will is no different than God's will. And find out that even though you are surrounded by other thoughts and other ideas, you are able to discriminate. And it doesn't matter if your thought is yours or somebody else, but you need to identify if that thought serves you, if that's truly the way you want to continue to move in your life. And you need to connect, again, with our true will and our true desire. That's a, a, a special idea that comes from the Course in Miracles that many of my English-speaking students like to talk about in, the, in our spiritualist group, is that our will is the same of God's will. We can momentarily be confused about what our true will is. So, through... Prayer, through the passes, through mediumship. And mediumship is not being in the mediums group. Mediumship is being here right now. Mediumship we develop in our everyday activities by raising our thoughts and reaching out to the good spirits. We find out more and more about our true will and our true self. And finally, service. Service through the volunteer work that the Spiritual Center will offer us. And I, in speaking of service, I will bring you this uh, quote by Tagore that I love so much when he says,
I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I woke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. So service is joy. Haroldo Dutra Dias did talk a little bit about service yesterday as well. But I will take now, I have one minute, and it's going to take more than one minute, maybe three minutes. So I'm a very, um, I try to be a very disciplined president, but I'm going to break my own rules here and go over the time for three minutes. So forgive me. Uh, but I must share with you this story from the master to close our um, talk today. We need to go back to him who is the sun, the light, and the healing, and the healer of souls. The story is narrated in this book, Light of the World, by the spirit Amelia Rodriguez, and it's called True Healing. And forgive me, it's very difficult to translate Amelia Rodriguez. I tried to memorize the story to tell you, but I am going to read. And so, it talks about the uh, conversation that takes place in the balcony of the house of Lavinia, who was noble and a rich woman. Some years past the time of Jesus. And Lavinia is talking to Miriam, who is um, her servant and friend. And Miriam is sharing with Lavinia her knowledge about the Christians. So she will say that the Christians constitute the most cordial group of all empire, unable to disorder or to disrespect of any time. I'm not sure what happened to the Christians. They love the truth and obey the laws cooperating to the general well-being of society. They're able to remain calm even when facing adversities in an unfair government. They keep hope even when persecuted and robbed. So she's telling Lavinia about her impressions and experiences with the Christians. And Lavinia is very surprised because she had no idea that Miriam actually knew the Christians. So she says, Miriam, you speak as if you know them. This really surprises me. You live in my house. You have been a special and dear guest since the days of my parents. I could never imagine that you would spend time with these people. They don't sacrifice to the gods. They go against the traditions of Rome. And Miriam said, I agree, noble Lavinia, that they do not revere the gods, but the one God that is unique, Sovereign Lord of the universe. You surprise me. You speak like a Christian. If this is the way I sound to you, noble Lavinia, I would like to share with you that Jesus fascinates me. This is blasphemy. Have you lost your mind? Why you never mention those ideas to me? You have never asked. And what do you have in favor of the crucified and against our gods? Nothing, noble Lavinia. Nothing against the gods. Only in favor of Jesus, who I met many years ago. And then Amelia Rodriguez describes that in that moment in which Miriam speaks about Lavinia, her big dark eyes are clouded with tears and she changes. She's even more beautiful. And Lavinia says, when you met him, were you already? Yes. It was the paralysis that took me to his presence. And he did not heal you? Don't they say that he was a healer? He did not heal my body? This is correct. Not my body. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you everything. When I was young, and my life was full of energy, and energy used to run through my system, and I was filled with enthusiasm and the hopes of the youth, but limited by my paralysis, I heard of Jesus. 
And I heard that he would go around healing the deaf, the mute, the paralyzed, the obsessed. And I ask and I implore that I would be taken to him. And her voice is cracking with emotion as she goes back in time to remember that important day of her life. He was spending the night at the house of Peter. And she's taken to him. And when she is in his presence, he would say to her, What would you like, dear daughter? I wish to walk again, Lord. And Jesus will stop, will look at her with his eyes. And then after a while, he will say to her something very special. He will say to her, Walk is not the most important thing in life as you think. I will give you a lot more. Go in peace. And she leaves. And Lavinia now can't understand. But you have never gotten out of bed. How can you say that you love and respect him? And Megan said, for a long time, I too could not understand and thought like you. Why did he not heal me? I met many people who were paralyzed, many people to whom he restituted the movements, the eyesight, the ability to speak, people who were obsessed and ended up healing. Why not me? Only time allowed me to understand. As time went by, I saw many people who had been benefited from his healing to become sick again, and some died. After reacquiring health, many forgot about their duties, returning to old harmful patterns of behavior. I, however, remain paralyzed. But little by little, I started to be taken by a very deep sense of peace and dominated by an unexplainable joy of living and of loving. And I transformed my suffering into smiles to the ones who were happier than me, and my resigned suffering silently taught others comfort and hope. She paused for a while, remembering of Jesus, and she said, I started to love him. It's true. I heard that he left. I heard that he reappeared many times. I was told about his deeds, his life, his miracles, and I found myself loving him to the suffering of the ones who were unable to meet him. I was then invited to participate in the beatings that were done in the name, in his name. And when there were time for rest, the break in between the studies, I would sing. I would sing in his honor. I would sing about his mercifulness and his love. I was healed. Not from the paralysis of the body, but my soul was healed, which is much more important. And your parents, when they passed through Jerusalem and met me, they invited me to come to Rome to sing to you and to become your friend. It is like I'm telling you, noble Lavinia. And Lavinia says to her, this Jesus, no doubt, despite my respect to the law and to the Roman tradition, seems to be like a God. Not a God, because there's only one God, but he's the Son of God, sublime king above all kings. And Lavinia gets scared because she's afraid for her friend. And she says, shut up, Miriam. So no one hears you and thinks that we are conspiring against the imperator. Silence your sympathy for the Christians. And the dialogue will end with Lavinia, with uh, Megan saying, I can't, noble Lavinia. Forgive me. But once one knows Jesus, one belongs to Jesus and gives his or her life to him so he can be the light and the sun guiding our paths. And so... I think this message summarizes what the Spiritual Center should be teaching each one of us. The true healing, the healing of the soul, empowering our soul so that 
borrowing for the, from the words of Albert Schweitzer. He would say, each patient carries within him, herself, his, her own doctor. The patient who looks for us does not know this truth. The best that we can do is to provide the inner doctor a chance to go to work. So folks, let's go to work. Thank you. <laughs>